What we eat and how we produce it is one of the issues of our age. It's about our health, it's about the economy, it's about identity. A plant-based diet is a solution to climate change. Will we lose the landscape of Wordsworth if we give up eating lamb or beef? Or do we create a new landscape, rewilding? And how should subsidies work as incentives? Um, and I, I put this one in just for Patrick because I know it's his catchphrase of should the polluter pay. And I know how much all this matters. I know it personally just because I had three years of John Humphreys chasing me around the Today Programme studio lecturing me about earthworms. But by the time he left, I was too an evangelist about soil. And I think we'll probably be discussing that. We have a first-rate panel to discuss these issues and no politicians. We boycotted them. So please welcome uh, George Monbiot, who you, you uh, pre presumably all know, environmental campaigner, uh, leading environmentalist, many remarkable campaigns, including rewilding. I think a clue to his views might be in the title of his Channel 4 program, which I'm sure you watched, Apocalypse Cow, How Meat Killed the Planet. So he wants to abolish livestock. Second, we have Joanna Blydman, who's an environmental campaigner, journalist, and omnivore, and she's going to be talking about sustainable diets. Then we have Richard Young, who's the policy director of the Sustainable Food Trust, and chairman of the Soil Association Committee, which drew up organic farming standards and campaigns against the misuse of antibiotics in agriculture. On my other side, we uh, then have uh, Peter Seger, who's one of Britain's organic pioneers, runs a 45-acre farm in Wales and founded Organic Farm Foods. And finally, Patrick Holden, founding director of the Sustainable Food Trust, an organic farmer producing cheese, milk, and meat in a 300-acre hill farm in West Wales. So if we could start with George at the lectern. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to make many friends here this afternoon, but every feast needs its spectre. I've been to several fascinating talks here, met some wonderful people, many wonderful people, had lots of great conversations. But it's giving me the sense of a convention of typewriter manufacturers circa 1970 talking about their expansion plans. We got this better ribbon. Look at this wonderful new carbon copy paper. We've got this incredible innovation to streamline the typing pool. Almost oblivious of what is happening beyond these walls. We are on the cusp of seeing possibly the greatest economic shift for 200 years. In food, the greatest technological shift in 12,000 years. And yet none of this has been acknowledged in any talk that I have been to so far. We are about to see a shift of the great majority of food production from farms into factories. I don't mean the processing of food that's grown on farms, I mean the growing of food in factories through precision fermentation of microbes. We're going to see a shift from farming to firming Fermentation being the key technology. And none of this looks realistic today because all technological disruptions follow an S curve. And at the beginning of the curve, when it's almost flat, you don't see it. It looks preposterous. It looks marginal. It looks ridiculous. It looks like something which is never going to affect you. So you turn your back on it and you ignore it as perhaps the typewriter manufacturers would have done in 1970, and Kodak did in the 1980s. And then suddenly, it gets to its extrapolation phase, and it gets you, and you've been run over by it. So the question I want everyone to be asking themselves is, are we going to carry on ignoring this and pretend it's not happening, and allow ourselves to be just walking down the lane while this juggernaut is coming up behind us? Or are we going to notice this juggernaut and then decide what we're going to do? And the second aspect is, this is not the only juggernaut. When you have a look at what is happening to the Earth's systems, you see there's another juggernaut coming down the lane, and that is 
that farming as we understand it today is not resilient. I'm now seeing paper after paper talking about multiple breadbasket failures caused by two degrees of global heating. Amplified Rosby waves stuck in the jet stream causing heat wave after heat wave after heat wave, knocking out our key cereal producing regions one after another and then simultaneously. We have 10 to 12 weeks of food stores on Earth. A major event like that, we lose those food stores. We see soil depletion at astonishing rates. We see the draining of aquifers at the same time as the glaciers are melting. Where is the water going to come from? We see insectageddon wiping out our pollinators. Where is the pollination going to come from? This food system that we have today, or anything resembling it, is not going to get us through the century. Even the idea that it could sustain current levels of production, let alone levels of production required for 9 or 10 or even 11 billion people, is fantasy now. The environmental indicators are all against it. So to my mind, this great technological shift, the shift from the farm to the factory, horrifying as many of you may consider this to be, comes in the nick of time. Both for humanitarian reasons, because it can feed the world reliably, and for environmental reasons, because we're talking about reducing the land footprint of food production by about uh, 10,000 times. Instead of using 40% of the planet's surface to produce our food, we'll be using 0.0001%, something along those lines. We can basically produce all the world's protein through the microbial uh, um, technologies now being developed in Helsinki on an area of land the size of Ohio, and ideally in desert because that's where solar panels are most effective. What will happen, and I think this is inevitable, is that first of all, the most valuable products will be knocked out of, of farming. We're going to see lauric acid going very quickly. And I say hooray to that. That's the end of palm oil. When bacteria in laboratories and then in factories are producing lauric acid, that's the end of the palm oil industry. That then impacts on other oil crops because palm oil is in competition with rapeseed and other oils. So we'll see them being affected too. We'll soon see the proteins which will be used for cultured meat being, um, being substituted. Even quicker than that, the proteins in milk. Only 3% of milk is casein and whey protein. That's the expensive part of milk, the valuable part of milk. They are very easy indeed to manufacture. Once they are manufactured, dairy, whose margins are extremely tight already, goes down. Then we start seeing the plant proteins being substituted. Then we start seeing the starch being substituted. And I think the only sector which is going to be unaffected by this will be horticulture will be fruit and veg. Those will not be grown in factories. They might be grown by different means, but they will still be grown. We'll still be using the same breeds. Otherwise, for the first time in human history, our staple foods will no longer be the products of photosynthesis because there are far more efficient pathways, such as hydrogen oxygenating bacteria, which can do it much faster. The foodstuffs will be very similar except that there will be novel foodstuffs coming onto the market at the same time as things which look very much like and taste very much like what's already there. But the environmental impact will be absolutely minimized. And from my point of view as an environmentalist, this is about the only good news around at the moment. It could be the best news that humanity has had for a very long time. Now, I know you're horrified by this. Of course you're horrified by this. Many of you are farmers. It's going to be devastating. I'm not making this happen. I happen to think that on balance, while there are major costs, the benefits outweigh them. But I also recognize that the costs are going to be borne primarily by people like yourself. I don't want that to happen. I want there to be a way out for farmers. I want there to be a just transition for farmers. But it's going to be really, really difficult because this is going to happen very quickly and the markets are going to be completely against you. I know you don't want to hear this, but it is in your interests 
to hear what I am saying because this stuff is real. This is happening, it's already happening, but it's at that low stage of the S-curve where you're not seeing it. But let's imagine for a moment that this was the other way around. Let's imagine that the great majority of our food, all the bulk commodities, was already being produced in factories in a completely regular way, in the same way as everything else that we use is manufactured. And it wasn't subject to the vicissitudes of the weather or pests or seasons, let alone of climate breakdown, and that it occupied about one ten thousandth of the amount of land we're currently using to produce food, apart from fruit and veg. Now imagine that someone came to a conference of those food producers and said, hey, guys, I've got this great idea. Let's shut down all the factories. Instead, let's domesticate one or two species of animals, a few species of plants, modify them beyond recognition, cut down most of the world's forests, drain most of the world's swamps, uh, corral those animals, castrate them, slaughter them, cut them up into bits that we can then eat, drink their milk, how weird is that? Uh, uh, then uh, slather the land with toxic biocides in order to prevent the inevitable outbreaks of pests which will destroy the cereal crops and hope that most years it will produce enough to keep the world going, though it might not. Doesn't that sound like a great idea? Of those two prospects, which is the most alarming? Switching from a reliable food supply to an unreliable and environmentally destructive one or from an unreliable and environmentally destructive one to a minimized, reliable one? I would say switching to farming would be the more alarming prospect. And while there are definitely downsides which we can explore, particularly for yourselves, the upsides involve a massive restoration of nature, a drawdown of carbon from the atmosphere on an unprecedented scale, possibly the ending of the sixth great extinction, the recovery of the abundance and diversity of wildlife which were otherwise hammering the repair and rescue of our life support systems and getting humanity through this century and those that follow. And that is a prospect, my friends, that is at least worth investigating. Thank you. In my view, for any diet to be credible or sensible, it has to fulfill two key requirements. Firstly, it must be a diet that keeps people healthy. That much should be obvious. And secondly, unless our diet is to override planetary limits and therefore trash the environment, what we put on our plates must reflect the productive capacity of our land. Now, I have interrogated the fashionable plant-based concept using these criteria, and I've concluded that I certainly won't be adopting it or recommending that anyone else does, um, and here's why. The traditional omnivore diet that most people of my age were brought up on can definitely supply all the macro and micronutrients our bodies need in a bioavailable form. By that I mean we can easily absorb them. Meat, for instance, provides us with high quality protein. That is to say it has all the essential uh, amino acids and all the necessary vitamins, minerals and fats, all in a, in a nice uh, uh, optimum ratio. Now, let's compare that with a vegan diet. Unless you take a supplement or you eat an unwise amount of sugar and salt-laden fortified processed foods, uh, you won't get enough vitamin B12. That is just a fact. And this is because, and let me quote Harvard Medical School here, there are no known plant foods that are natural sources of vitamin B12. And they continue, I quote, Research shows that vegans who don't take a B12 supplement often have inadequate B12 levels. And this is an essential vitamin of great importance to our health. Inadequate in intake can cause anemia, nerve damage, very serious consequences. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, any diet that automatically leaves you deficient in essential micronutrients, a diet which by definition isn't nutritionally complete enough, to sustain healthy human life is a non-starter. 
But okay, what about a plant-based diet, though? That doesn't sound so extreme. Well, let's have a look at the Eat Lancet plant-based diet that is currently being heavily promoted. It drastically restricts animal foods. It, it, it allows only one, up to one and a half eggs a week, not a day a week, and not more than a daily mouthful of red meat. Now, Dr. Zoe Harkham, who I'm sure many of you will be familiar with here, has analyzed the Eat Lancet diet using the US government reference values for micronutrients. And she concludes that if we followed it, we would become deficient not only in B12, but in vitamins K, D, K2, D3, and minerals, potassium, sodium, calcium, heme iron, and essential fatty acids. One of the big problems about trying to get all your nutritional uh, requirements from plants is, is that unlike animal foods, the micronutrients they contain aren't so bioavailable. So for example, uh, example calcium absorption from spinach is only 5% compared to 27% from milk. Now, bear in mind that proponents of Eat Lancet are pushing it as, and I'm, this is their phrase, not mine, a universal healthy reference diet that is applicable to everyone everywhere. Yet, vast swathes of the world's population suffer from undernutrition. Now, when I met women tea pickers in Darjeeling, they told me that they dreamed of being able to afford a house cow. That really was their dream. And, if it, and why was that? Well, because they could use the milk from the cow to feed their children. The meat eventually would help them feed their children. They could sell the hide eventually for leather. And the animals' manures would help fertilize their crops. Um, these women really worried about their kids going hungry. And I think that when ideologues living in affluent countries, countries where obesity, type 2 diabetes, and neuroticism around food are rampant, when they try to pressurize poor countries into eschewing animal foods and going plant-based, they are displaying crass insensitivity, and I would also say a colonial white savior mindset. It's, it's stark staring obvious to me that it is the ultra-processed food diet that we've started eating in the last 60 years that is driving diet-related ill health and obesity, not traditional whole foods like meat in their natural forms. Yet one of the ironies of adopting a plant-based diet is that most people will end up eating more of the former and less of the latter. I mean, the other day, for instance, I heard a plant-based cook saying that she now uses, and again, quote, high-quality sunflower spread instead of butter in a traditional cake recipe. But this kind of spread is just trendily marketed margarine, which is one of the most heavily processed foods of all. Give me our native butter any day. Now, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> obviously, if you choose plant-based, you consequently have to turn your back on most of the foods that the UK is best at producing because they are animal foods, meat, dairy, eggs, fish from our waters. The UK is not Sicily. Our current food security, that is our self-sufficiency in food, is only 60% at present. And our livestock farmers are mightily dispirited because of all the attacks that are being made on them. A shift to plant-based would make Britain's food security plummet further. All it would take would be a stress to the global food system, such as a war, for our shelves to empty within days. To get a taste of how local resilient food cultures can be undermined by plant-based dogma, we can travel to the Nunavik region in Alaska. There, the local health authority has been recommending a plant-based diet in the form of an igloo-shaped pictogram. At its base, in place of the fish fat and flesh that were life-sustaining, locally available staples, the pictogram shows images of mangoes and pineapples. I'm told that these sugary fruits have to be flown up from Mexico. Oh, by the way, rates of obesity and type 2 diabetes are soaring up there in Nunavik. The same craziness is affecting us here. 
We're encouraged to eat jackfruit and banana blossom, both unconvincing vegan substitutes for meat. They either come from Thailand in tins, or they might even be air freighted fresh. Now, I really feel that we've lost the plot when arcane imports and genetically modified fake meat burgers dreamed up by venture capitalists in Silicon Valley are portrayed as more acceptable than a lamb chop from a British hillside. But as part of its great food transformation, uh, Eat Lancet and people like George actively want to stamp out the existing multiplicity of distinctive and diverse food cultures that are predicated on local history, seasons, traditions, cultivars, breeds, and artisan methods. And they want to replace them with a monocultural, globalized diet, one that's centered on factory and laboratory food. They would replace this culinary richness, this wonderful natural biodiversity, with a top-down, we know what's best for you diet. They would take the culture out of agriculture. Now, for 30 years, I have campaigned against factory farm foods, and I've written books asking people to boycott them. My view has always been that they have no place in any aware ethical diet. But I'm now running out of patience with plant-based proponents who use the worst examples of factory farming as a broad brush with which to smear all livestock farming. Okay, I expect this from extremist vegan organizations. They don't seem to me to have any hands-on experience of or in-depth knowledge of food production, farming, even cooking, be it animal or otherwise. These tunnel-visioned evangelists have swallowed hook, line, and sinker, the generic and qualified lies and distortions they picked up online. But from people like George, to be honest, I find such crude arguments intellectually dishonest. I feel that he should know better. And when... <clears throat> And then I hear George promoting as dietary saviors the most ultra-processed food. Fake, food-emulating products conjured out of thin air. He tells us that technology will solve everything, that the future is already decided. Of course, certainty about the future makes for, <coughs> excuse me, certainty about the future makes for more dramatic headlines than nuance, uncertainty complexity. But the truth behind this rhetoric of inevitability is that these technologies have huge problems. The doctrine of high-tech inevitability is propaganda. It demands not our participation, but our subservience. We should see it for what it is. Those who claim to know the future are trying to own the future. Thank you very much. I'd like to be setting out the Sustainable Food Trust sort of complete vision for the future of food and um, farming. But as you'll all know, there's one very fundamental difference between George and us, which comes down to the role of livestock. Um, almost everything that George is concerned about in terms of the destruction of the natural world, the problems of intensive farming, we share those those concerns, and we ought really to be working together to resolve them. But for us, for us, the ruminant livestock, grazing livestock, in the UK in particular, because two-thirds of our farmland is really only suitable for grazing, are, as far as we're concerned, the actual central component of sustainable food systems. Now, I've been and a fan of George's over many years, and I've followed his campaigns and his brilliant journalism and his robust use of statistics, and I've tended to believe that everything he wrote was factually accurate. But more recently, some of his claims have not rung true to me, and I've started looking into them, actually checking the sources myself, and I just want to go th briefly through one or two of the examples that have stuck out to me. Um, grassland productivity, 
is something that he frequently talks about. And he's claimed um, in, a, in a very influential Guardian article in 2018 that we only, got, we only get 1.2% of our protein from grasslands worldwide. Now, this is a trick. Perhaps a trick is an unfair word. It may, be, it may not be deliberate. This is something a lot of vegan campaigners do. They'll start talking about the UK, and then they'll switch to global statistics when it suits them, and they, when they're more sensational. However, taking... I can't tell you exactly what the situation is globally, and I'm pretty sure nobody knows that accurately, because um, what's happening in some of the dry lands is very difficult to estimate. There are no, there's no accurate data. But George claimed that roughly, that roughly twice as much land is used for grazing worldwide as crop production. It provides just 1.2% of the protein we eat. And that's a direct quote from his article in The Guardian. Um, the reality is he's misquoting his source, which was a report by Tara Garnett called Grazed and Confused. And in that, she and her colleagues make it quite clear that they're uh, talking about meat that's produced exclusively from grassland that gets no um, grain at all. Now, there's a very small amount of that, even in the UK. And if you look, we've done the calculations to see how much meat is actually coming from grass in the UK. This isn't all meat that's exclusively fed on grass, but this is the proportion of the meat that can be attributed to grass. And we haven't exaggerated the figures. And that works out at just a fraction under 20 grams per day, which is 25.6% of average daily intake of protein, 76 grams in the UK coming from grass. And if you add in the, the non-human crop wastes into that, it takes it up to over 30%. And that's still not including the high quality grain, which could be going to humans, which is also fed to some animals. Um, he correctly claimed last night in Apocalypse Cow that only less than 1% of calories are coming from sheep in this country. But calories is not something we're particularly short of. If you look at protein, it's 2% from sheep, sheep. And of course, sheep and cattle produce protein, which is far superior in quality in terms of a whole range of important micronutrients, which we're deficient in in this country, um, than vegetable proteins. The other thing that he... On the next page is calculations. I've given George a copy of this. Um, I won't go through those now because we don't have time. But if he wants to challenge this, we'll be very happy to publish his response to these points. Uh, last night in Apocalypse Cow, and I, I have to say that I'm, you can't help but be impressed by the way you genuinely concern, concerned about the environment, the passion you feel for, for nature. And we share that. And I totally understand your determination and your wish to do something dramatic to put things right. But you actually claim that the carbon cost of eating four kilograms of beef is equal to flying to New York and back. Now, the reality is that you're exaggerating by between four and 22 times. Um, using the uh, report which you've quoted from yourself, um, which was published in 2018, and the figures they provide, taking the most extreme figure which they were able to find where there was very um, high peaty soils and some loss from those systems, flying is still four times more carbon intensive than eating four kilograms of beef. And if you take a more typical figure for the UK, it's 22 times. Now, my suggestion, my feeling is, and the calculations follow, that people have been influenced by those sort of claims. And um, you've made similar claims back in 2015 in The Guardian. Um, and I'm just going to ask you, and it's not just you, it's other vegan campaigners, is it any coincidence that uh, air travel from the UK has increased by 20% in the last four years, a massive increase in four years? And what I feel is that these campaigns that focus so exclusively on red meat, and particularly ones that are using false statistics to do that, are actually giving a lot of people the impression that they can go on flying around the world as much as they want, provided they cut back on red meat consumption. And the, even these figures on the footprint are based on an IPCC traditional way of calculating methane. And as some of you will know, if you came to a session last year or a session we've had today, or if you read the research from Oxford University, um, because methane is a short-lived greenhouse gas, 
and as much has been lost, broken down every day as it's actually been produced by ruminants, a stable population of ruminants does not actually add to global warming whatsoever. And in the UK, we already have 25% less cattle and 27% less sheep than we had in the 1980s. So some people would argue that we're already contributing to global cooling by the situation in the UK. Now, last night also, you repeated a similar claim which you've made before. You said that 90% of soya I think you use the word embedded, is embedded in livestock um, products. Um, you've previously claimed it was 93% and 97%. Um, but the reality is, in the UK, 57% of the soil that we import is fed to livestock. Um, if, we, if, if we don't uh, include imported meat, it's only 39%, but there's about half a million tonnes embedded in impor imported meat. We import, um, in total, in 2017-18, 2.7 million tonnes of soya products, that's whole beans, meal and oil. And we use, according to government figures, just over 1 million tonnes. The rest is, is, is used in the oil, which is going into all processed foods, and um, the, much of the meal goes into pet food, and into a whole range of industrial products, including paint and inks, and even an additive for making... Uh, stopping tarmac sticking to the rollers when they're resurfacing roads. Um, just briefly, looking at soya milk, or soya drink as it's now called, um, vegetarians tend to claim or assume that drinking soya milk is going to actually mean they're using less soya. The UK produced 14.9 billion litres of milk in the last year for which we have figures, and um, that equates to between 90 and we, if you look at the actual amount of soya that's used, with figures I've got from DEFRA, that's between 90 and 169 litres of milk is produced in this country for every kilo of the residue soya, soya milk meal, that's after the oil's been extracted for processed food, that's fed to, to, live, to cattle, to dairy cows. If you take soya milk, uh, one kilo of whole soya beans makes just seven and a half litres of soya drink. So in fact, the uh, soy drink is using at least 12 times more soya uh, than dairy cows. And the reason for that, of course, is because we've got very good grass in the UK and most of the production is coming from grassland. You also told Abby Reader that uh, palm kernel meal was a problem contributing to uh, rainforest destruction. Um, I think you're mixing up palm oil and, soy and palm kernel products. Palm kernel is just a small bit from the palm oil, from which oil is also extracted predominantly for detergents. And that, um, that, that meat kernel that's left, the, the, the dry meal, has no other uses at all that I've been able to discover. Uh, the only way to reduce our dependence on palm oil, which is predominantly used in processed food, is actually to go back and start eating animal fats again, particularly if they're produced on grasslands. Um, you make a lot of about carbon opportunity costs and you want to see natural regeneration. It would be lovely, wouldn't it? I'd love to see it too. But the trouble is we import a vast amount of commercial timber and if we were to allow forests to regenerate, very little of that would have any commercial value so we'd still be contributing to rainforest destruction just to produce the timber we need for construction and so on. And we could, according to the Climate Change Committee, um, bring about a big reduction and meet our targets with a 13 to 17% increase in woodland in this country. We don't need to cover the whole of farmland in woodland to achieve that. And in fact, the um, Clim International Panel on Climate Change has advised against that because it was said it would cause too much intensification of agriculture and lead to more desertification. If we use agroforestry or other techniques, and particularly if we just had a subsidies to encourage farmers to plant hedgerows in their plant oak trees in their hedgerows again, we could actually meet those targets without losing um, farmland. Um, now, the miracles, uh, we heard about those last night. Now, I don't, I don't deny that there may well be some developments coming which we're all going to be very worried about. And I also think even in some ways, if we could produce this sort of miracle food and get rid of intensive livestock production, there would be some advantages. But it strikes me that the very last thing we need is more processed food. We need to move to real food and that 
these things have not been evaluated properly and when you look at the amount of energy they will take and also the problems that will come with them, we'll find that actually they're a false vision and fool's gold. Thank you very much. Hello. I was asked to come and give a talk today, but unfortunately the person who asked me to give a talk, which Patrick Horn, didn't tell me what to talk about. So I had to invent what I was going to say today. But since I've come to listen to the conversation, it's extremely difficult because I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been a vegetarian for 50 years. Well, I'm not I'm a bit sloppy vegetarian, but I still have eaten meat 50 years. And I like all the things that George is talking about, particularly about fruit and vegetables, so I don't have a problem in that sector. <laughs> and I like Patrick, of course, because I've known him all my life. He's the most wonderful farmer and friend and person. And everybody else, and Joanna is wonderful, and Richard is wonderful. <laughs> so I have nothing to do. So my talk, which was going to be very lucid and articulate, is out the window. <laughs> And then I thought, right, what I will do is I will then talk about health a little bit. And my talk about health is really on a very simplistic level because we all know that health is a very difficult subject. And to prove it, I'm now 74 years old. I just hope and pray I live long enough not only to see the grandchildren grow up but also to see it proven scientifically that the way you farm, the way you manage the land has a direct relationship to the health of our food and the health of human beings. <laughs> our, our, my work at home is, is a small vegetable place and we sell only in Wales and we try to search around the world for new varieties of vegetables and salad leaves which have extraordinary flavor. Running under the illusions, not an illusion but could be, uh, that actually taste is directly related in terms of the quantity of secondary metabolites and antioxidants to health. So if that's true, we have the healthiest customers in the whole of Wales and the whole of Britain because <laughs> they're the, the tastiest food. Yeah, it's logical. And, and, but you need vitamins and minerals too. And this is really the only thing I really want to say tonight is I don't understand the government's um, attitude to food. I never have understood it. In the late 70s, I picked up some data from the USDA, the American um, Agricultural Department, that said in the previous 20 years, from 1950 to 1970, the quantity of vitamins and minerals in the American diet in fresh produce had halved. And I thought, this is extraordinary. Surely somebody's working on this, but nobody was. And then I saw an article, you might have seen it in The Guardian last Saturday, where it said the same thing is true in Britain over the last 20, 25 years. So where on earth, on this planet, do you have a government in cahoots with a, an industry sector body and probably civil servants that are deliberately allowing and manipulating the reduction of the very health-giving properties of the foods that they encourage us to eat and doing nothing about it but actually encouraging it by reducing the quality of the soils they farm on. How is it possible? How has it never been picked up? How has it never been campaigned? Why have I never done anything about it? I don't know. Anyway, that's what I came along to tell you about. And uh, I just want to say that the envelope in which this is couched is basically, when I hear about a lot of things George was saying, the only area I really sort of go on, Joanna mentioned it, is the processed foods. I mean, I don't care what people eat. If they want to eat meat, they can eat meat. As long as they don't make me eat it, it's okay. And when you get to a situation where all these processed foods we don't know how they're grown. So for anybody discussing the issue about these new types of novel foods, if you like, whether they're grown vertically, you know, all that sort of stuff growing vertically, salads and, and growing under caves in the central London, so hydroponic stuff, 
all that sort of stuff, they should ask themselves the question, unless they want to reduce the diet and the health of the UK generally, how is it grown and where is it grown? Thank you. Richard said that I'd been a, a fan of George's for many years. I've ad admired him as an environmental campaigner. But more recently, as he's turned his attention to food, I felt increasingly uncomfortable with uh, what he is saying. And it's good. I'm glad that uh, Richard has challenged some of the science behind some of his assertions. And I couldn't help feeling, uh, as George was speaking this afternoon, that he was addressing what is probably one of the world's greatest gatherings of expertise in the subject of sustainable food production. And that's a really important feature of these conferences, that it brings together such an amazing community of people. And I also couldn't help reflecting that so many of the views that I feel are wrong in relation to agricultural policy, nutrition, and everything else, are voiced by people who don't understand agriculture. And with respect, George, I, be I think that because you're not an agricultural practitioner, I'm not blaming you for that, but I think some of the things that you've been pronouncing on are not born out of a deep understanding of agricultural practice. And I'll just give one example. Uh, in the film last night, there was a, a picture of the amount of land which is devoted to food production, and then it was compared with the amount of land in pasture producing meat. And Rich has already quoted some statistics which suggest that George's estimations of the amount of nutrition, and Joanna, from that meat has been underestimated. But what strikes me about the challenge that we're all facing, assuming that George can't, or the scientists in Helsinki, can't turn water into wine, which I think is delusionary without having investigated the science, is that all those farmers who have been extracting the natural capital of our soils, particularly in the arable east of the United Kingdom and all over the world, who already know of it, many of whom are here, which is a wonderful thing, know that in order to rebuild their lost fertility and move from chemistry to biology, which is surely the greatest threshold of change that we need to confront right now, will not be able to do so without introducing fertility building sections of their rotations, which will normally, in this country at least, be clover and grass. And if we wish to turn that clover and grass into food that we can eat, in my case on 300 acres in West Wales, it's dairy foods, uh, then we need ruminant animals. And the, the, we've had other sessions here which have discussed the methane issue and the Oxford University challenge the methane, all the rest of it. But it's not right to see the grassland and the meat on its own separate from the vegetable and the grain production, which, as has just been said by Peter, has been nutritionally diminished as a result of those intensive farming practices. So I would just say this to you, George. You're a brilliant speaker, and you are an enormously influential person, not just in this country, but throughout the world. We actually, this was an email I received today, uh, we need your support, George, and it would be a shame if your tendency to polarize the issues uh, makes it more difficult for what I agree with you is the greatest transition that has ever occurred in human history to take place in the way that it needs to along the lines that Peter has outlined, namely deriving our nutrition from farming in harmony with nature and producing food without further diminishing the natural capital which has been destroyed for, during our farming lifetimes. So let us have a civilized debate. I'm delighted you're here. It's really great that you accepted this invitation. I hope it won't be the last one. Thank you very much. So, um, George, Will it be the last time you come, firstly? Um, secondly, I, I guess the sort of the, the accusation that in order to try and save the planet, um, you're um, willing to destroy the culture of food, I think, was made, and also that you were being a bit Trumpian with the facts. Do you want to just answer those? Thank you. Well, look, it's always a great pleasure to be here. <laughs> and, to be, and to be loved. Thank you. <laughs> Look, I, I spent my whole life telling people what they don't want to hear, so this isn't much different to me. Uh, on this factual thing, Richard, we're all entitled to our own opinions. We are not entitled to our own facts. We're certainly not entitled to start making things up. 
So, for instance, you say, I exaggerate by, I'm just going to take one example here. I exaggerate by between 4 and 22 times the carbon opportunity costs of beef. I just checked, while you were saying that, the source, which I gave, live tweeted during the program, also gave in my article, searching at et al, Nature, 13th of December 2018, table one, average, including meat from dairy animals, 1250 kilograms um, per, uh, of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilogram of beef protein is the average. It is not the extreme figure that you claim it to be. It checks out completely. What you have done here is to create a false set of figures while accusing me of falsehoods. Anyway, we'll just park that one because we could go on forever with it. Because, yeah. We're going to take questions. Yeah. And, and we'll take questions. Yeah. But just on the broad sense of sustainability, it's very striking to me how the other panelists, with the partial exception of Peter, have not been engaging with the environmental crisis which is heading our way. You know, even if you can dismiss everything that's happening technologically, that juggernaut, what are we doing about climate breakdown, which A, threatens the food supply, and B, is greatly exacerbated by the way in which we're producing food? And the biggest issue of food production is the amount of land it uses, because that is all land which could otherwise be used for drawing down carbon on a massive scale, which would otherwise be used by wildlife and complex natural ecosystems rather than the highly simplified human food chains, extensive or intensive, that we use it for. And I'm just absolutely staggered that in the midst of a climate emergency, that is not the top line of what we're discussing here that it's being largely ignored or just shoved away as a marginal footnote. Thank you very much. And if I can just ask one question and then um, open up the floor. And I, I mentioned earlier that there are sort of two um, things going on. That there's climate and then there's this interesting date of, of January the 1st and the first thing we're going to be looking at so afterwards will be... One second to sure. just literally just to yeah. I mean, George, I mean, you say we could go on forever and I'm sure we could. But just to explain, your source wasn't obviously clear from the programme. I wasn't following you on Twitter. But the, I used a paper which you have used yourself, which is produced by a vegan scientist based here in Oxford. And I was using his figures to yes, show... Which weren't that, carbon opportunity costs. They, they were current, they were current just, amount... Uh, just what I'm trying to say is that there are an awful wrong. lot of sources out there which we yeah. can selectively quote from. And one needs to try to look mm. at a lot of different sources. So uh, forgive me for accusing mm. you of misquoting in that sense. But what I'm suggesting mm. is that you chose a source which was ex exceptionally extreme. Well, it's in Nature, which is the top-ranked journal in this area. It was carbon opportunity cost. We're talking about, um, you're talking about carbon current account emissions. You simply got that wrong, Richard. Let's return to this, shall we, um, after, perhaps after the debate. Um, so my one question was, um, it, in terms of the sort of local traditional um, that, that we're talking about, or use of land in terms of um, the, the greater uh, good of of, of promoting the of saving the environment, where are you on sort of self-sufficiency? Can I just ask? Because um, that is one option that, that that's coming up. George, would that would you be pro that, or you think bad use of? We're land? talking about national self-sufficiency. Yeah. Is that correct? Well, Food self-sufficiency. Uh, I mean, in some things, it makes sense to be producing locally, particularly high-volume horticultural goods. You know, um, but in most cases, the food miles is a very small part of the environmental total environmental impact of that foodstuff, sometimes it makes more sense to import. And let's also face the fact that much of what we call local food actually is highly dependent on global food chains. So I see locally produced sausages being advertised. They've been fed on Argentinian soya. And, and, and so, you know, we've got to examine the whole food chain, but also the entire environmental impact, not just the food miles. Joanna, any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I want to take George up on this thing about no one apart from him, basically, is engaging with climate breakdown. I think that's actually really insulting. <laughs> you know, George seems to think he's got intellectual property rights on climate breakdown. And it's quite clear to me, I talked about the environment very clearly in what I said. Everyone here who's interested in regenerative agriculture is advancing that as a response to climate challenge. Now, 
George is doctrinaire in this respect. He has one view and the rest of us have to fall in line. And if it isn't couched, we're not following Georgie's argument, then we're ignoring climate challenge. And I really resent that. And I think actually you should sort of take that back, but I'll let you off with it. I'm just stating that that really annoyed me. Okay. And we're just, okay. <laughs> maybe the, uh, maybe you go to the floor, but maybe just not just attacking George, but if we could also, <laughs> Um, any, any sort of thoughts or solutions or ideas or, um, and I'm going to start with the red scarf because it's um, very visible. Um, Carl Schneider, editor of Farmers Weekly. Two very quick questions for George. Number one, um, aren't you worried? Uh, first, I'd like to say absolutely I echo what Patrick said. I'm really pleased that George is here and saying this. Yeah, the fact that we don't agree with everything George says, I think it's not then fair to say we don't want to hear it. And I'm really pleased that this discussion is happening in this forum. So thank you, George, for coming here and saying what you did. So my two very quick questions. Number one, aren't you worried that your vision for the future puts food production pretty much entirely in the hands of corporations? And number two, um, I know some of the criticisms of current agriculture is the fact that you have monocultures, you have single crops in huge areas over a field. Now, don't you think that some of the interesting new technologies coming into agriculture, like small-scale robotics potentially give us a way of moving away from that monoculture and a lot of the risks and the, the reasons we have to put lots of pesticides on crops and so on because it allows us to have for example multiple crops spread through a field because you're dealing with plants on an individual basis rather than you know big machinery gives you monoculture but small robots maybe give you a much more diverse uh, and environmentally rich environmental uh, agricultural culture um i mean this is exactly what I said in my article yesterday. This is why we have to get ahead of these technologies and stop pretending they're not happening. And unless we do, that's exactly what's going to happen. It's going to be massive corporate concentration. Incidentally, there already is in bulk commodities. We know about Cargill. We know about ADM. You probably know about these guys better than I do, Carl. We know there is vast corporate concentration in global commodities. What is essential is that the new technologies aren't going to reinforce that. And for that to happen, we need to see very strong antitrust laws. We need to prevent IP and patenting from being allowed on the key technologies. It needs to be open source. But that's not going to happen unless we're in there campaigning on those issues from the beginning. You know, we've got to make sure these technologies work for us. And to do that, we need to be involved in that debate and involved in discussing them. And that, for God's sake, is what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to get people to face the reality of what we're seeing. Now, I don't know how long it's going to take, but it's happening. I'm not trying to own the future. I don't own any of these technologies. I've got no commercial stake in any of it at all. Um, I just see it happening, and I see that there are lots of reasons to welcome it and also some reasons to fear it. But there are also, I think, some enormous reasons to fear the trajectory we're on under an agricultural scenario, too. So on that, on your second question, also a very good question, yeah, I can absolutely see there could well be ways, there are ways, of reducing the impacts of mainstream agriculture. And while we're still practicing mainstream agriculture, absolutely we should do those things. But if we can find ways of producing food, enough food for everyone, with far, far smaller impacts still, then we should also welcome a transition to that. Okay. So if this, um, if this factory produced food, if we get some bacteria into it or something goes wrong, it's all produced in one tiny place to feed the whole world, I see a potential disaster happening. Whereas the alternative system that we have at the moment is this diversity of farmers. Uh, we've got horticulturalists, we've got uh, dairy farmers, we've got meat farmers, we've got different people farming with different systems all over the world, and we've got millions and billions of farmers. And I see that there's much more food security in having this diversity of farmers and also having biodiversity in practice on our farms, which is what we've been talking about for the last two days. I, I agree with George's position mm. on some things. For example, it's probably better to import Spanish tomatoes um, 
late in the autumn or in the, if you're going to eat such tomatoes out of season, which we would recommend you don't, uh, rather than try to grow them in greenhouse in the UK with an awful lot of energy. But we d I do feel that in a world with, where global warming is becoming an increasing threat, where we're seeing extremes of climate, that we're very foolish to rely on other countries to supply our food in the way we have done in the past. Uh, we should do everything we can to look after our soils in this country, and that actually means putting grassland back into some of our arable land, because those soils can only be regenerated by trees or by grassland, and trees won't produce any food. So uh, I think we should really focus on making the UK as secure in food as it possibly can be, but it will never be 100% secure. Um, able to produce its own food, obviously, because we've got a very large population, similar to that of France, and they've got five times as much land area as we have. Um, Patrick wanted to make a point well, about that. Well, building from that, I'd, I, this is a, the message that we'd like you to preach, George. Um, obviously, I couldn't put words in your mouth, but um, in the, during the grand transition to uh, agriculture, less food production, I hope that you would agree that in answer to the question, what should we eat to be sustainable and healthy, we should align our diets to the maximum extent feasible to the output from truly sustainable climate change addressing uh, food systems applied at scale in this country. And we need to know what food would be produced if we converted the whole of the UK to sustainable food systems within planetary boundaries. We then need to divide the food output between the 67 million or whatever it is, and that would be our daily portion of, of the various foods produced. Of course, we need to eat more vegetables. And, you know, Tolly is here, Ian Tolhurst, who was on the film. He said to me yesterday, by the way, he said, I've got nothing against sustainable livestock production. So it's important you know that. And I, I think you were right to highlight Tolly and indeed Peter. I'm not sure if you visited his farm, but he's, he's the, the Welsh equivalent of Tolly, I'd call him that. Um, <laughs> But if you were able to say that we need to eat consistently with the output of sustainable farming in the UK, including animal products, because I don't want you to rewild my farm, I just want you to know that, um, I think that would be very, very helpful for our campaign. Hi there. Um, my name's Emma Olive. Um, I have a mixed history in farming. Um, and I have two questions, very quickly. Um, one of them is if you consolidate all of your uh, food production into uh, firms and, and factories, what is going to happen to all of the agricultural land that I know you would like to rewild? Um, because you're going to put all of the farms out of business who own that land, and what would be the next step? Considering pretty much everyone here is supporting some form of rewilding, agri-wilding on their farms, the money to put into that is going to come from agriculture and livestock and arable and pasture, um, silvo pasture. Um, secondly, um, the takeover of these corporations is already happening. Um, Solar has four um, investors already, and one of whom is Phaser, who is a large company in Finland, and there is no legislation. There's, yes, it's okay to lobby for it, but it is already happening. These companies are already coming forward. They're already large. They're already being um, dominated by the markets. And I'd just like to ask, what, how is the policy going to come forward? Who is in charge of it? How is it being put to our government to, to regulate these things? Thank you. Well, I'll address both questions because we didn't really give you an answer up the top. Um, the first thing on that is that a small area doesn't mean one area. Just because we're minimising global food production by these means, if it does, as I believe will happen, it can happen on thousands and thousands of different sites, but collectively they add up to a very, very small area. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying it's all going to happen in one place. Um, what will happen to agricultural land? Well, what I want to see happen is farmers paid to make a transition towards nature recovery and rewilding. The money which we're currently using to support farming, when we're not going to need um, to farm nearly as much land as we do today, I would love to see farmers paid to rewild. Now, there's a huge scientific literature showing that land sparing 
um, is much, much better for wildlife and ecosystems than land sharing. Because however well you might do your farming system, you are replacing a highly complex ecosystem with incredibly complex food webs, many of which we don't even fully understand yet, with a simplified human food chain with some very specific outputs which are taken off the land. And however well you do that, it will never be as good in terms of natural ecosystem function as nature itself is. As a friend of mine said, listening to all these people saying we are the stewards of the land, how did nature cope before we came along? But anyway, if this is my final comment, I just want to say thank you very much, everyone, for listening, even though it might have been difficult. <laughs> And Joanna, did you just want to add something to that? Yes, I, I would, uh, picking up, I think your first point it was, I'd like to inject a note of cynicism about what I would call techno-optimism. If we look at <clears throat> the Finnish startup that George is, you know, very positive about, first of all, we're right up against commercial secrets. They won't disclose the full nature of their process. They have something which is called a proprietary organism. What is that? Um, uh, is not in the public domain because it's covered. Excuse me. Well, I'm quoting from Food Navigator, George, and they have been reporting on this company. So I'm afraid that is actually the phrase. I didn't invent it. And we have a problem because we have a novel foods legislation which new products have to go through. But we know that EFSA, European Food Standards Authority, and the committees that scrutinize these new, new things are very heavily corrupted by the corporations who have a vested interest in getting permissions. So I think we have to, and, and when I hear you, George using words like precision fermentation, that to me needs to have in parenthesis genetic modification. Let's do one last uh, one then from the lady here. You've, you've used global figures, George, so let's get global. You've talked about the pain that we be caused to us as farmers in the UK, 1.2% of the population. The um, let's look globally to the millions of subsistence farmers. You stop them farming. How are they going to buy your Soylent Green products? Well, first of all, I, I think I need to point this out again. I'm not stopping anyone from farming. Yeah. I'm not developing these technologies. I think that they're a good thing on the whole. But whether or not I'm involved, if I drop dead tomorrow, it wouldn't change anything. These technologies are being developed independent of me. I'm telling you they're coming. That's all that I'm doing here, but I'm also saying that I think it's quite good that they're coming. However, you're quite right. For subsistence farmers, this is going to be a real issue. This is another reason why we shouldn't be burying our heads in the sand over this, as I fear a lot of people here are doing refusing to see what it is, just finding excuses for dismissing it, finding excuses for ignoring it. Against the disruption for subsistence farmers is going to be the fact that finally we have a means by which everybody on earth can be fed with an adequate and good diet without disruption, without climate breakdown affecting that. As far as this production is concerned, if there are amplified Rosby waves causing simultaneous global heat waves, taking out multiple breadbasket regions, it's not going to affect it. Whereas if we carry on on this trajectory, relying on farming, we are going to quickly hit a situation where huge numbers, probably billions of people, are not going to be fed. And that's a far more serious situation than anything else that I certainly can envisage. I think this is going to arrive in the nick of time. It gives us a way out from that horrendous situation. But obviously, there are losers here. And we have to be cognizant of those losers, and we have to help those people over this incredibly difficult and disruptive time that's coming. But at the same time, to recognize that if we don't take these steps, there could be something far more difficult and far more disruptive coming down the line. Thank you. Um, I yeah. just wanted to say this, that notwithstanding the polarized nature of this discussion, um, since I've been coming to national conferences of this kind, and by the way, the man on my right, Peter Seger, 
had the idea of organising what amounted to be the first national conference in sustainable agriculture at Sirencester in 1980, and many of you were there, actually. Um, I have never felt such a spirit of collective consensus or optimism that the people here today can bring about the change that's necessary uh, to confront the greatest challenge in human history, naming producing enough food to feed a, feed, a, feed a peak population, working in harmony with nature, and making the land work not just to produce food, but actually to coexist and rebuild the natural capital we've lost. So I don't think we should end on a, on a note of pessimism, because that's not the atmosphere of this gathering. It's not. We're going to... <laughs> Thank you very much. We're going to end on optimism and um, thank the panel very much indeed for their contributions and for you for coming. And see you all next year, including George. But